Welcome back to Fourth and Forever. I'm your host, Mark Sanchez. And before we get to today's special guest, I got an interesting piece of mail this past week and I felt like it was topical, but uh, from a former employer in Washington. Well, you can read it for yourself because I don't want to get in trouble for saying anything, but you see what it says, you know, right up there somewhere and uh, hail to the football team and the logo. So yeah, just listen, I'm not going to say anything to anybody, but whoever's in charge of stationary and letterhead might want to figure that one out quickly. All right, guys, very excited about today's guest. He is one of the top football players to ever come out of British Columbia, Canada. He was a former star receiver for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish and a newly added weapon in Pittsburgh for the Steelers and Big Ben. I'd like to welcome Chase Claypool. Thank you, Chase. Thank you for having me on the show, guys. You are actually our gateway into an international show. You are our first uh, international guest by way of British Columbia, Canada. Right. So I'd like to play your national anthem, number one. <laughs> Hit it, man. <laughs> and I'd also like to take a shot of syrup just for you. I appreciate um, that. I don't do this on a regular basis. And you also have to take off the cap. <laughs> Inside, <laughs> but you guys are smart up there to make sure this doesn't drip and get sticky everywhere. Here we go. Sing it, Chase, go. Free and white, oh, Canada, we stand on God for thee. God keep our land glorious wow. and free. Canadian flag. You got a Canadian flag. <laughs> yes. Yes. Look at See, this is what we do on this show. Oh, we man. bring people together. That's what we do. Should I just drape Gosh, this over I my back? This. I love that. I love that. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, so British Columbia, coming from Canada, talk about you're the youngest of four brothers. Uh, four brothers. You have two stepbrothers, a sister. Your mother, Jasmine, I understand, was a member of a traveling carnival. Mm -hmm. So explain your family situation growing up. Yeah. So, like you said, I'm the youngest of a whole lot of brothers. Um, so I guess with that being said, I was kind of the one who got picked on, um, you know, by way of birth, uh, birthrights, and I was I got I drew the yeah. short end of the stick there. So for a lot of the time I got picked on and then in a good way though, it's all love. And then I um, became uh, bigger than them and I did the picking on. <laughs> so it feels good now that I'm, you know, I got like a, a few inches on, on all of them and a few pounds on all of them. But um, coming from my brothers, being the youngest there, I got picked on and then um, you know, I grew bigger than them and kind of outgrew that. And then the carnival, uh, she did that when I was in high school, and then I would go on the shows with her, and I would run a little game and get commission on that. You would be on the actual carnival show? Yeah, no, it's like a fair. It's more like a fair. And then, you know where okay. you, like, throw darts at the balloons? Yeah. She did that game, and then I ran a kid's game, and um, I suckered them all in, and it took all their money. So you got, like, some some side action at a carnival and you're making money on the side? I was it, making, do I have this yeah, I was making side bets with the parents. Like, oh, your kid's not going to win this game, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I was doing over-unders. Um, yeah, I did well. I did well there. <laughs> over-unders. Wow. So from an early age, you were hustling. Okay. Then explain any kind of, um, you know, big obstacles you've overcome or adversity you faced growing up. Obviously, your mom had to be on the road quite a bit. So I'm assuming you and the brothers were home quite a bit. 
Alone? N- yeah, I mean, no, she would um, she would only be gone for the weekends. And uh, a lot of the time in high school, um, I would go with her. Uh, it, it was the fact that she would go when I was in college, since I wasn't home anyways. Uh, she would go yeah. She would go and do her thing then. Um, the tough part is when I would come home, because I'd only come home for two, three times a year, and her schedule didn't line up, so I wasn't able to see her at that time. So like, that was the tough part when gotcha. she was on the road and then I came home. Okay, and how much money would you say you made in this side hustle game with balloons and over under and the, the little side racket you had? Yeah. Are we talking like lunch money here and there or like, No, we're talking, you know, we're savings. talking to like new Jays type money. Okay, so now you're at these carnivals, your mom is running the game where you throw darts at balloons and you're saying you had to blow up these balloons? Mm, I mean, so it, it depended on what I was doing. Uh, usually I would be running my own game, but uh, if she ever needed a balloon blower, that would be me. I've just been drawing the short stick in life for a long time. So then they pop the balloon, and then there goes your stanky ass breath all over the car. It's more like, exactly, it's more like, they <laughs> throw the dart, and it's a little kid, and, you're like, and, the, and the parent's like, oh, I hope he like hits as many balloons as he can i'm like don't hit a balloon please don't hit a balloon because i'm running out of oxygen type thing (laughs) okay i like it um you talked about drawing the short straw and get into some of that growing up i mean there's um articles and other other things online that talk about you didn't grow up rich uh you weren't like completely dirt poor but closer to the ladder than than rich. So talk about some of those things, that those things you struggled with growing up and just uh, your hopes, dreams, aspirations. Where did all of that come from and that fire? Did that build a fire in you that made you want to provide for your family or anything like that? Yeah, most definitely. I think I definitely came from humble beginnings because I feel like I've seen, you know, both sides of the coin. And, you know, like you said, we weren't, like, poor, um, but there was definitely times where, Um, My mom struggled and, you know, a lot of parents do. And, you know, there was a time, you know, we went to the food bank. We had food stamps, all that uh, for a short period of time Mm -hmm. there. And, um, you know, we moved around here and there trying to find a a good spot. But, you know, for for a good portion, um, we weren't we weren't struggling too, too bad. But, you know, there's definitely some times where I could see my mom, you know, trying to make ends meet and, um, you know, it's very stressful in that situation, and I, and I saw that. So, you know, the fact that I'm in a position uh, to kind of remove that stress from her now, and she never has to worry about, you know, making ends meet, that's uh, definitely adds fuel to the fire. No, oh, that, that's got to feel great, and and uh, we commend you for doing that. That's wonderful. Appreciate it. Um, then let's talk a little sports growing up. You're in Canada, no hockey. You're a BMX guy. How does a big kid like you even fit uh, fit on a BMX bike? Uh, that doesn't make sense to me. See, talk to me about that. I grew up playing hockey with my friends. Um, I honestly, I didn't play ice hockey, um, but I played roller hockey and street hockey, and there were some pretty big um, mm-hmm. games going on, um, especially where I was coming from. Like, you would walk down the street and everyone's playing hockey. Um, so I played that for probably like three, four years, and I was a goalie for a little bit, um, for actually probably most of the part. And then I transitioned into biking. Because you couldn't skate. Um, you couldn't skate. I'm kind of nice, actually. <laughs> That's the, no, no. You play goalie because you can't skate. No, I played goalie for a little bit because I was a big body. I was a unit back in the day. <laughs> um, a unit. And. Yes, yeah, so I rollerbladed like to school. I rollerbladed at lunch. I was that kid who threw on the rollerblades and did, wow. did tricks. Wow, rollerblades and stuff. like elbow pads, elbow pads. Uh, see, I was so um, I would say elite that I didn't need that. But I, there was some kit. Jeez, <laughs> oh, here we go. I didn't have the four wheels like the you know the little derby derby ones. I had yeah. the like the actual ones. So. Yeah, in line, in line. So yeah, it was impressive to say the least. But um, so I did that, and then I went to. Middle school, so I did that from like grade two to like probably grade five, and then I went to middle school, and then I met some some new friends who biked, and I got into that. And then once my knees hit uh, my chin, I stopped BMXing. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, then you're obviously pl- you're playing basketball, you're playing football. Um, 
to American sports, any idols that you looked up to growing up, uh, you know, watching those sports in the U.S.? Yeah, I like LaDainian Tomlinson. Uh, he was my favorite player. That's why I wore 21 Ooh. for okay. um, Very good. basically my whole my whole career there. That's awesome. Yeah. LT, baby. Yep. Uh, have you ever met him? I have not, no. So hopefully one day I get the chance to do that. What would you say if you met him? I would probably just say... Other than, hey, I'm Chase. Yeah, and, and then freeze on the spot. Um, no, I'd, pro- I'd probably uh, just kind of thank him for everything he's done for the game. He was also the reason why I want to play running back. And I think me playing running back at an early age kind of helped me develop um, into, like, part of the player I am now. It could seem to be far-fetched, but I think it honestly did help me playing running back. Um, so I'll probably just, just thank him for, for uh, all that he's done, whether he knew it or not. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, so I got a chance to play with LT with the Jets his last two seasons and he's a complete stud. Also, when he got to the team, I see a locker set up for LaDainian Tomlinson, number 21, and it's like three lockers down from mine. And I looked at it, I was like, what the hell? Well, I didn't realize that like NFL teams have like these free agent visits and it's almost like a college recruiting experience, right? right? You wanna show them a good time, you show them the facility, you see their jersey, all that kind of stuff, you see what your locker would be like, all that. Well, they had the helmet with the dark visor, they had everything set up, a 21 Jets jersey. I was like, oh my God. And so I ran in and I have like a towel on and I asked the equipment guys, I'm like, yo, what the hell's going on? What's with the LT stuff? And they're like, oh, he's coming. Oh yeah, by the way, um, uh, management wanted me to tell you you're going to dinner with him tonight. I was like, oh my God, (laughs) holy shit, LT? So I I understand why you were such a fan of his and um, I'm sure you'll, you'll interview with him at some point, but we'll definitely send him this clip and he will appreciate that yeah, for sure. Yeah, no doubt, great dude. no doubt. So you're in high school, you're playing basketball, you're averaging over 40 points as a senior, you get all these offers, but football after your junior year, zero offers, mm-hmm. but you only gained interest from colleges when you post your highlights on Facebook. So what was the, uh, I guess, reasoning for the Facebook post? Were you gonna do that anyway? Or was this like, hey, somebody figure this out because I'm good enough to play. No, it was, it was so a coach, uh, SFU, so Simon Fraser University was a D2 school um, down the road from where I lived. It was probably a 30 minute drive. Mm-hmm. And it was like the only uh, NCAA school. Uh, all the other schools are CIS, so just Canadian college football. Um, so mm-hmm. a coach reached out, reached out to me at the end of my grade 10 year and he's just like, hey, we're interested. And that was, like, super cool for me because, like, obviously that was, like, my first interest in, you know, uh, football after high school. So he reached out right. to me, and he's like, hey, we're going to be watching you next season. And then in the middle of my junior year, uh, I think three or four games in, he asked for a cut-up of kind of – he wanted offense, defense, and special teams. So I made that cut-up, and – um, I just posted on Facebook because that's where he was messaging me through. And that is okay. the reason why. And I think you're getting the first um, scoop on this because I literally just remembered the reason why I post on Facebook. Like all the other articles, I couldn't really remember why. And then I was going through my old messages and I saw that he was the reason for it. Wow, look at that. Yeah. How about that coach? D2 school. Yeah, so. I, close to you. That's I, awesome. I know. But then you're getting yeah. all these You're getting all these offers for, for basketball. So why go football? Yeah, so in my grade 10 year, I did the AAU circuit. Um, and, you know, I was getting interest from some small-time schools. And then the um, my coach had told me that the bigger schools um, were really looking forward to watching me um, in the next few AAU circuits. So that would have been after my grade 11 year because it's in the summer. And so I finished my grade 11 year in football and I believe right. I, I didn't have any offers during that season. I had no offers during that season. And my brother comes up to me after a basketball game for high school, high school basketball game. And he goes, yeah, my coach saw your film and he thinks you, he can get you a division one offer in two weeks. And uh, but the only catch is that for basketball or football for football, uh, he's like, but you can't okay. you can't play AU. And I was like, damn, like I was really looking forward to playing AU. Oh. All my friends uh, played for the AU team. It was like a really good time, and that was the year I was going to get like big time offers. Hopefully, um, yeah. 
So he's like, you can't play AAU football. You have to make a decision in literally in like the next couple of days so we can get to work on it. And, you know, I just put all my marbles in one bag and kind of said, you know, I'll do the football, football route and just commit to that exclusively. And then I did that. And two weeks later, I got an offer from Nevada. Wow. Look at that. Okay, but you still love basketball. Who's your favorite NBA basketball team? Uh, Toronto Raptors, baby. Defending world champs. Of course, the defending yes. champs. How mad were you that Kawhi left? The claw. I was not mad at all because he came in. First of all, like he obviously didn't want to come in the first place. So the fact that he right. wasn't a diva about it, and he just, you know, he, he did his year. That's what we got him for. He did his year, got us a championship, and then you can enjoy life. That's all we need is just one. Just need one. I'm not <laughs> That's greedy. All we need I'm not greedy. I like it. Um, okay, so then let's go through this high school football senior year stats because it's like you and, I don't know, Derrick Henry who have some of these outrageous stats, but you also have them at multiple positions, including quarterback, which um, I'd like for you to explain, but six of eight for 195 yards and three touchdowns. Was that garbage time? Were those like real throws? Can you name some of the routes you threw, or did you just black out like, and start playing quarterback? I don't understand. Um, so I was bugging my uh, uh, offense coordinator all year, like, because I would throw the ball, and I'd be like, oh, my God, that was so <laughs> nice. I was like, I look like Mark Sanchez out here. Oh, my goodness. Sign You're me. such a receiver, dude. No, if I had a nickel for every receiver that said they should be playing quarterback. Yeah, it's just that it's I was ridiculous. like, I looked myself in the mirror not to sound too boastful, but I was like, if this isn't prototypical uh, quarterback <laughs> structure or frame, I don't know what is. So I was like, anyways, I was like, okay, if we're killing this team by half, like, I need to go in. Um, so <laughs> it in. was okay. absolutely garbage time, but some of the throws were kind of – Next level, I would say. Kind of nice. Okay. Yeah. Except for the two you missed. Bummer for those. Yeah. Um, let's see. Throw. You had seven kick returns for a touchdown. <laughs> 74 tackles and two sacks. A forced fumble and five interceptions. I don't... What were you doing on defense? You're the star receiver. Yeah, I was playing safety. Um, I was playing safety full time. And then the special teams. Oh my so I only gosh. got off the field. And then I don't even know. I guess I didn't get off the field because I held for a field goal. You held for field goals too. Yeah. Yeah. Holy cow! And you think you can throw? So there goes the trick field goal in Pittsburgh. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Fifty-eight receptions for fourteen hundred seventy-three yards, eighteen touchdowns as a senior. Holy cow! Uh, add to that another eight touchdowns as a running back on 47 carries and 567 yards. That's your uh, ode to LaDainian Thomason. Yep. That's pretty impressive. That's pretty awesome. Appreciate it. So that. then um, you have Nevada offers. Give me some of the other big name schools, at least, you know, Michigan, Oregon, Tennessee, Nebraska. Is that right? Any other big ones? Yeah, Notre Dame. Uh, I committed. So I started getting offers in, I would say, May, maybe a little bit before that, March. And I committed in July. Of your senior year? Yeah, like of my, going into my senior year. My, before going my into senior, senior year. year. Yeah. So I committed okay. at the opening on July 10th. Um, so I committed super oh, early. Oh, that tournament. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was actually kind of like a little like pressured into committing. Um, not by way of anything that the coach did, but like, you know, the classic like, oh, we only have so many offers left. And I had went. Oh, the, the rule of scarcity. I, they got you. Yeah, they got me. But uh, luckily, it was the right decision. <laughs> I felt really good with the school. Um, so I committed early because I didn't want that offer to leave the table. Um, because I did take, that was my fifth visit. And I liked that one the most. So I figured. Ooh, where else did you trip? Washington, Oregon, Michigan, Notre Dame, and Rutgers. That's five. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything stand out from those recruiting trips? Yeah, I think the main the main reason why I went to Notre Dame is because we had to live in the dorms for however right. many years, like two to three years. And I actually wanted to do that because, you know, the people I met in school was going to be like, you know, lifetime friends and connections for the rest of my life. And it kind of rung true for me because I, I room with um, a chemical engineer and then a finance guy who's doing investment banking. Wow. Um, so they're going to be there um, for me for the rest of my life. So that's pretty cool. That's awesome. Did you, are you working with that financial guy? 
with so my roommate actually invested my money for me um no way yeah and then he helped me invest my money okay, when cool. the stock market crashed with this whole corona stuff and he he made me 40 yeah. percent. so it's pretty good there's nothing wrong with that. No, can't complain. Uh, feel free to text me his number. I'm going to hit him up. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. After uh, all this money I steal from uh, Jerry Dice. Jerry Dice. Uh, let's see. So, Jerry Dice. So then you transitioned from Canada to Notre Dame, and Coach Kelly is quoted talking about your growing pains when you arrived. For every college athlete, that's normal. Uh, but explain, you know, your personal situation and, you know, what was he referring to and where did you see maybe your most – personal growth yeah so i think when i went in there uh to to camp um i had a db i'm not gonna name his name but i had a db like trying to press me like not even just like press off the line right. but like trying to like you know challenge me because i was a young dude and you know i was like whatever whatever and then i we ended up fighting um because I figured there he was only doing that because I was Canadian, and that was part of the reason why. And I didn't want to be the guy who went in there and got pushed around and, you know, looked down upon. Of course. And then, you know, when I did that, I was playing super well in camp. When I did that, I kind of saw a little less playing times. I was like, okay, I can't do that anymore uh, because I have to, you know, prioritize playing first. And then... You know, a couple of weeks go by and we're still preseason. And then we did this block and drill and I won the block and drill. And I had some guy like open hand, like punch me in the face. And I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. I was just talking. And then my friend, uh, Equinemius St. Brown, plays for the Packers now. He told me, he's like, if anyone ever does that to you, you like, he's like, you have to fight them. So that was kind of the, the main thing was like, anytime anyone tried to do that, like I would, I felt obligated, obligated to fight them. Um, right. And over time, I honestly gained the respect of my teammates, not through fighting, but for standing up for myself. And then eventually coaches as well. So I just handled it in different ways. And I think that's what Coach Kelly was talking about in terms of my maturity. So if something would like, like that sure. would happen, I wouldn't turn to fighting. I would just beat someone um, on the field rather than fighting them. But that took me a minute because... Um, that's just kind of how it was. It's your initial reaction. That's, yeah, of course, of course. And you're trying to establish yourself. You're coming from a, a totally different place. So right. it, it's understandable. And it's, it speaks to your maturity now because you're going to face that situation again in the NFL just here in a couple of days. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in training camp. But there's going to be some, some veteran DBs that need to show the young rookie his place. And, um, you know, I think... Judging by your numbers and everything at the combine, I think you're fine relying on your athletic ability exactly. and your route running and just being physical within, you know, the rules of the game. I think, you know, that experience will help you where you're at now. But go back to uh, special teams. So for people watching that aren't familiar, wide receivers, it's usually the bottom part of the roster of guys that are um, or, or like the three, four, five wide receiver, maybe the sixth wide receiver will play special teams mm -hmm. and that kind of gives them an opportunity to make the team to uh, establish their role on special teams and then hopefully get a couple catches but you are the number one target and you refuse to get taken off of special teams to the point where you are in a contest with your offensive lineman as to who can get more pancake blocks yeah, that's right. at receiver or on special teams you're you know you're making tackles on kickoff explain your love for special teams, where does that come from? Yeah, I think I just, um, going into college, I knew special teams was going to be something that got me on the field. It's something that a special teams coach mm -hmm. told me right away. He's like, man, if you um, if you play special teams, man, you're going to get reps in the game. And not only that, you're going to travel and you're going to have a much better time than watching the game at home. So, and like we talked about before, I played defense uh, basically my whole life. And special teams was kind right. of the opportunity to play a little bit of defense here and there. Uh, so that's kind of where that love came from. And then the reason why I kept playing it is because at first it was to get me on the field in college. And then I obviously kept playing because I loved to do it. And the reason why I didn't even want to get off my senior year is because I knew how important it was uh, for the league. And I knew that was something that NFL was going to look at closely. And that was just even more motivation to keep playing that. I love that. 
Then uh, you're ranked seventh all time in career receptions at Notre Dame. Four seasons as a wide receiver, 150 catches, 2,159 yards, 19 total touchdowns. The 2019 team MVP voted on by your players. How did Notre Dame shape you during your formative years? And what do you love so much about that school? Yeah, I think uh, the reason why I was able to, you know, kind of have those accomplishments is because Notre Dame is so much outside of football. You know, there's so much growing that can be done from um, the activities outside of football. I think the dorm room's big, just kind of the family environment that Notre Dame brings to the table. So I think me growing as a person allowed me to grow as a football player. And, um, you know, I think not a lot of schools can offer that because you know, a lot of the time you're just surrounded by football players all the time, which is good for some, but could be bad for others. You know, you need a break. So right. I just think being able to live both lives as, you know, like a student and all my friends just look at me as Chase and then a football player. I think that was that was kind of good for me. Right. That's awesome. Well, then, um, is there any other Notre Dame stories that you haven't told anyone that won't get you in trouble that you care to share today? Um, Something good. You and Rex Fluger, maybe. Could you beat him one on one? Uh, in basketball? Yeah. I haven't shot a basketball Ooh. in a long time. Right now, I don't think so. Oh, come on. I don't think so. I know he's going to be tuning in. But if we played, <laughs> if I was a freshman and he was a sophomore, I think it would be close. I think it'd be close. Ooh. I think it'd be close. Rex. Hmm. Yeah. We might have to bring him on for a rebuttal. We'll do, um, okay. yeah, um, we'll, we'll do a little YouTube video of me one one v one in uh, Rex. <laughs> I like that. Um, Anything else the from story. Notre Dame? How many waffles did you? Because you're like 240 pounds. How many of those ND logo waffles did they still have those? Because they, they had did. those on my visit out there. They did. Yeah. Um, I yeah. ate. You um, loaded up on those. I, I made six, ate half. Packed the other half of my backpack, <laughs> went to the dorm, <laughs> ate the other three. Such a college move. I love it. But love a story it. that I can say is um, I met my roommate because, so I was rooming with a random person. That's how the dorm system works in our name. You room with someone random. He ended up being uh, a baseball player and one of my best friends today. Um, but he moved dorms in his sophomore year. So my freshman year, um, I got a note under my door and it's a girl's phone number and her name. Ooh. And then there was this like little Ooh. common area that we, we, all the guys hang out in and they just talk. And then my, this guy was like, uh -huh. yeah, like I just hooked up with this girl. I was like, yeah, I think that girl, like honestly just, uh, is trying to hook up with me now. And he's like, no, she's not. I was like, <laughs> yeah, she is. Like, and he's like, what's her number? I gave him, uh, her number and all that. And we just decided, we mutually agreed that we should have a slap fight, and the winner gets the girl. So <laughs> we did that, and that, and then and you've been single ever since. And I, yep, I lost badly. <laughs> no. uh, <laughs> um, so we did that, and there wasn't like any clear winner. But that's the first time I met him, and then we just became best friends ever since because <laughs> we were both crazy enough to actually go through with that. <laughs> How did you meet your friend? Well, we slapped each other around for a while. Yeah, okay, exactly. Good. Then um, you get to the pre-draft pre -draft combine. Uh, your people are trying to figure out, are you a wide receiver? Are you a tight end? Are you in between? But then you hit the 4-4-2, 40 yard dash. You hit the 40 and a half inch vertical. There's only two wide receivers to measure 6'4 and 235 or bigger and run a sub 4-4-5. That's you and obviously Megatron Calvin Johnson. So what did you want teams to know about you as a person and a player, uh, to convince them to draft you leading into the NFL draft? Yeah, I think I was really well prepped to do the interview process through Notre Dame because um, they just do that through their business classes. They kind of prep you for job interviews right. and all that stuff. So I wasn't worried about that at all. And then probably a week before the combine, my me and my two agents, uh, Kyle McCarthy and Brian Murphy, got an argument of what I should weigh because um, I was at like 235 and I was like, yeah, I could easily put on five mm -hmm. more pounds, be 240. And then Kyle was like, no. And Murph liked that, I'm sure. What was that? Murphy loved that. Oh. Murphy he, loved oh that. Oh my God, yeah, he ate that, he ate that up. So, <laughs> but uh, Kyle oh, was like, no, no shot. Down. He's Got like, it. if you can get below 230, that's great. And I didn't want to because I Whoa. knew what I was gonna run because obviously we tested it and all that. 
Um, right. So I knew what I was going to run, and I figured the heavier I am and the faster I run, the more impressive it's going to be. And even though Kyle like always said like, "No, it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad," I ended up, you know, putting on three more pounds for the combine, um, weighing in, and then I saw Twitter blow up. Yeah, Chase Claypool tight end, and I honestly didn't care in the slightest because. Um, because I knew what I was going to run. So as soon as I ran all those, um, I guess, um, rumors or whatever um, kind of disappeared. How does it feel knowing you just have a 4-4-2 four, four, uh, in your back pocket? I, I really want to know because I'm not fast. But sleeping the night before the combine, knowing I'm going to wake up, I already weighed in, I'm enormous, and I'm going to run a 4-4-2. Four, four, How many times did you run 4-4-2 four, four, leading up to it? So I, I actually PR'd by a lot in my 40 but my whole goal is to run a sub four five and the way our mm -hmm. training worked is if you ran let's say a four five four in training you're on like good pace to run a sub four or five because everyone pr's our prs at the combine in our training group um for like the past mm -hmm. however many years like you would run one time and that'd be your time for your pre-running whatever and then you'd get to the combine and you'd almost cut that by like a full tenth of a second so the fastest I and ran. And who did you train with? What was the what was the group you trained with? Athletes first, and then proactive. We worked at proactive. Um, in, with uh, Capretta. Capretta, yeah, and Andy Campbell there. Nice. Yeah. So. Very good. The fastest I ran was maybe a four four nine, maybe a four five zero. But that's, oh wow, that's because you know we're kind of in the meat of training, and whether we know it or not, we're kind of fatigued. So lean up to the combine. Right. You run. Fresh, like it's, it's actually how you feel running, um, or it's actually how you would be if you ran and you got ready for a race because you wouldn't be training hard wow. the previous day. So, right, right. Fastest I ran was a four five zero, and the highest I jumped with all the training and everything that we were doing was like thirty four inches. And they're like, "Oh my god, like that's really, wow, that's really really good." I was like, "What do you mean, like thirty four? That's so bad. That's like <laughs> that's like I broke the record for my lowest vert." And they're like, "No, like." The way you're training, the way your muscles are reacting, blah, blah, blah. Like, once you're fresh and your legs are good, you're going to kill everything, so. Yeah, that's, I mean, their numbers this year and the guys, the combine numbers were insane for proactive uh, Andy Campbell, Ryan Capretta. And then uh, to see the draft picks, the way they went, I mean, guys are getting pulled off the board fast. Yeah. So you go 49th overall to the Pittsburgh Steelers and just getting to know you this past off season here in Orange County, hanging out with you and Rex Pfluger, I can tell that you are well-suited for the Steel City. It's a blue-collar town, tough fans, great fans, but tough fans, and they want someone with a little grit to them. Right. You know, and it sounds like the way you grew up, you're going to fit right in. You want to block. You, uh, you want to play special teams. You're a blue-collar guy, and it's, hey, man, what can I do to help this team win? So I think it's the perfect pick. I'm sure they were biting their nails and freaking out a little bit when you ran 4-4-2 because then it kind of puts you on everybody's radar. Right. And I'm sure they were a little worried about losing you. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that. But um, So then how much communication leading up to the actual draft did you have with Mike Tomlin and the Steelers? So I only talked to the Steelers once, and it was Coach Tomlin. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it was, oh, I think it was by way of chance um, because we had these little quadrants in the combine and you, we would just walk and we'd go quadrant one for 15 minutes or whatever, 30 minutes, talk to all these coaches right. and then we'd go to a different quadrant and it'd be like a different set of teams. So I had no one to talk to, so I was just wandering around and I'm pretty sure I just bumped into Coach T <laughs> and he's like, all right, let's sit down. I think, I guess, I think he might have just liked my size or something. Um, and we sat down, we had a talk, and and it went well, but that was about it. And my friend, uh, who's a diehard Steelers fan, called me, like, a day before the draft, and he's like, yo, like, man, is there any chance you go to the Steelers? I was like, dude, I was like, there's no shot. I was like, that's one of the teams I didn't talk to at all. Um, so I thought there's no shot uh, of me going there. Well, what did he say? Give me the skinny. What did he ask you? Uh, w w when I met with uh, with Coach T? Yeah, yeah, when you met with Coach T. He just wanted to know kind of what type of football player I was, and he asked me a series of questions in terms of just, like, if this happens, 
Like, would you rather do this or this? Would you rather um, oh, okay. knock a player down or score? So you played down? Would You Rather with Coach Tomlin? Yeah, it got pretty intense. Things got a little weird, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Did you tell him you loved him and uh, love in basketball? Yeah. So I was like, when we were concluding <laughs> the conversation, he's like, "All right, man, good talking to you." I was like, "All right, love you." He's like, "What?" I was like, "What?" <laughs> so I was like, "Is he very good?" I was like, "Did you hear something about it?" I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, okay, and then where were you when you got the call? Um, explain the feelings and emotions uh, that you felt and obviously that um, echoed through your entire family. Yeah, so I was at an Airbnb because um, since when I left, uh, my mom would, would stay with my uncle. So I got me and my mom an Airbnb for the month that I was going to be there for. Right. And so that's where we had it set up. And I had all the family there. And on day one, I honestly wasn't expecting to go just because of the way things happen. You know, I thought I was going to, if I had a chance to go on the, in the first round, I thought it'd be the Bills. And then they got Diggs. And I was like, okay, like, I think that was right, my only right. shot. Um so I wasn't watching as intensely as I was um, day two. Day two, I was on the couch the whole time watching every pick, uh, had my phone in my hand. And then I wasn't getting discouraged at all by that time in the draft. And honestly, like, as long as I went day two, I would have been absolutely happy. I could have went last pick in the third. I would have been happy. Um, so mm -hmm. when I did get the call that early, um, I, was, I was super pumped. It was just like I couldn't stop smiling, which was – it was – a weird feeling, but I just couldn't stop even if I tried. And uh, everyone was like silent in the background. And then when I said uh, the Steelers, like they erupted. So that was, that was really cool. I love it. That's awesome. Uh, what about, so you didn't only get your mom an Airbnb to stay with you for Mother's Day and then uh, for Father's Day for your dad. Talk about the gifts you gave him. What did that mean to you, and uh, what was their reaction? Yeah, so I was able to make uh, some marketing money during the pre-draft process with some signing cards and stuff like that. So I had a little bit of money, and I figured with this whole coronavirus stuff going that I wouldn't be able to travel back and forth at all. Um, and, you know, if I went to the States, I might be stuck there for a long time. So I wanted to make sure I did right. something nice for them before I left. And being home and seeing... Um, kind of what they were dealing with in terms of my dad had like a his van had to have been 20 years old like he had to repair it every week my mom was driving a 2001 Pontiac Sunfire um, wow so I was just driving with a friend and we just looked over and we, we saw a, a Jeep dealership and we wanted to check that out and um, then the day it was a big process it was spur of the moment or it was planned it was like we saw the Jeep. If we didn't drive by that, it might not have, like, sparked my thought of doing it right now. I probably would have done it at a later point. But I was like, oh, shoot, like, right. let, let me go check out what I can do with this. Uh, met a good uh, sales uh, sales guy, and uh, we kind of just got the ball rolling there. And then I was like, yeah, I'm doing this. So I committed to that. Oh, that's great. That's really cool. Mom got the Jeep, dad got the Ram, the Dodge Ram truck. Yeah, I love my dad was That's like, great. Chase, I would never ask you for anything, but I was like, if I were to ask you for something, I would ask for a truck, but I'm not gonna do that. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay, I got you. Yeah. I'm not asking, but. But I would love a truck. I was like, yeah. So yeah, he said that though. He said that uh, when I was like a sophomore in college and I just remembered. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. He's, he's oh, like, when good. you make it big, I'm not going to ask for anything, but uh, just a truck. Just a truck. So. If you come across the truck. Uh, yeah. Very good. Okay, so then now it's the 2020 NFL season, we all hope, um, and you're learning an NFL offense virtually with these Zoom meetings. <sighs> Talk to me about, is that difficult? How, how has that been for you? And where do you feel like you're at with learning the offense? Yeah, no, it was, I was on the West Coast and obviously the Steelers were on the East Coast and there'd be some times where I'd have to wake up like 5.45, um, four, six o'clock meeting because it was at nine um, Eastern time. So mm -hmm. in terms of just that, it was kind of tough, but the actual offense itself wasn't too bad at all because my offense that I came from, from Notre Dame, had a lot of the similar concepts. It was just getting rid of the oh, that's good. play calls that we used to call them. Um, 
Right. So I, I had to stop thinking of it as the college name and then start thinking of it as the NFL, NFL name, obviously. So as soon as I did that, um, like any offense, once you get like the base foundation of it, learning anything else, like the new additions, is you know super easy. So right. uh, I got it uh, down good. pretty good, I, I, I think. So. And your first conversation with the likes of Ben Roethlisberger, he's got a you know got a chip on his shoulder coming in. Um, you know, after elbow surgery, and he's got to be excited to get back out on the field. Have you thrown with him? What were your conversations like with Big Ben? Yeah, no doubt. Um, so Big Ben called me right after I got drafted, and, you know, he said it's Ben nice. Roethlisberger. I was like, oh, oh, shit. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, he's, like, super excited to have you. Like, uh, I was on his radar. Like, he, he was one of the, I was one of the players that he was checking out. Um, so that was cool just to know that he was kind of involved in that process. And he said, just excited to get you down here, um, excited to get you working. And then I was, we were able to do a couple player run practices um, a couple weeks after the draft, a few weeks after the draft. So um, I did that with him. And, and what, about my, what about my guy Juju coming from SC? Did he give you any yeah, Notre Ju- Dame SC rivalry talk or how did it go? Juju was actually awesome. He was super, super nice, super welcoming. He still is. Yeah. Um, Good. And he actually, suggested me the place that I'm living in right now. So he was very helpful oh, great. in like all aspects of everything. That's good. He'll probably pull the fire alarm later on tonight. Okay, yeah, cool. No uh, let's see. Then the COVID protocol with coming back and testing, uh, social distancing, explain what that's like. Cause that's something I'm not familiar with as a player and never had to, to go through that. So uh, what was your first day like? How has it been since then? Uh, give us your, you know, your kind of day to day. Yeah, so uh, when I got here, we had to, uh, we had one day off to like whatever acclimate ourselves into whatever situation we're in, and then the next day, I heard that we had to get tested every day. I was like, that can't be right. So we got we get tested, and then I hear that we quarantine for three days, in case we do have it, um, and mm-hmm. to wait for the test results, and then we get tested again to make sure there's no false negatives or any false positives. And then we quarantine for another right. three days, and then we can uh, start going into the building. And then from that point, we had to get tested every day. So I've got tested every day uh, for the last week and a half, two weeks or so. So. And it's the nasal swab, rapid results, or finger prick? Which, which one? It's uh, it's the nasal swab. Yep. Wow. And you get your results right there, or they wait um, until you? I think it's pretty soon after, but it's not right there. They have to. I think okay. gather all the results for everyone to come in and then they take it and do a mass yeah. sampling, yeah. So then you got all this uh, new protocol for COVID and testing. I mean, you see what they've done in the NBA. There's a physical bubble that you're not supposed to leave and you still get players leaving, getting themselves into uh, some predicaments over at uh, Magic City. Right. <laughs> um, but what have they told you from a team standpoint because there aren't those physical bubbles but it's kind of a honor system with the nfl right now and they're expecting you to go straight home like what are the directions from the ball club yeah so we we got an email um from the nfl pa kind of listing all the things that we can can't do and a lot of it is like common sense it's not saying that obviously we're not in a bubble and they can't really mandate and control everything that we do. So it's more of like, how much do you care and how much do you want there to be a season? Right. So, you know, any type of thing like going out or being in a social gathering that's not family or super close friends is like, you know, pretty fra- frowned upon obviously because the risk is that much greater. So, you right. know, um, I guess you could say like going out to any any type of restaurant where there might be a lot of people, you know, one of those uptown uh, restaurants. So uh, it's yeah, not. That's tough. It's not so cr- a lot of DoorDash, a lot of Uber Eats. Exactly, a lot, a lot yeah. of, a lot of video games. So you just trying to yeah. stay in the house and keep. Did busy. you pause your Tinder account, or did they make you pay monthly still, or put you on like a lower charge for less activity? How does that? Yeah, so they actually flagged my account because I had so many matches. Well. Um, so they flagged my account. They're like, this guy is honestly stealing everyone else's match. And, um, yeah, so that's, uh... He said they flagged his account because he has too many matches. <laughs> said he's stealing other people's matches. <laughs> Chase it. 
Oh my God, I don't miss you at all. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> okay, um, so now we're looking at a new look Steelers. The last three drafts, they've drafted a wide receiver in the second round. It was Juju, it was James Washington, now you. Uh, J- uh, James Connors establishing himself as a premier back in this league. Ben Roethlisberger's back. What do you add to this team? And what are your personal goals for this season? Yeah, I think the biggest red flag uh, for them last year was their red zone uh, efficiency. And I think that's kind of, you know, the immediate impact that I can make is red zone efficiency and kind of adding a threat in that offense. And then beyond that, I also think that I'm kind of one of those guys who can uh, make an impact in special teams and then throughout the entire offense. And uh, I'm going to use special teams in the red zone to kind of prove myself. And then hopefully the coach kind of realize what I can uh, bring to the table. That's awesome, man. I think those are great short-term goals. Now, if we look uh, big picture and, uh, you know, that thousand-foot view, where do you see yourself when it's all said and done, uh, when your career's over? How many years does that look like? And what are your NFL career goals? Yeah, so obviously you want to you wanna be a guy who wants to win a Super Bowl, and that's – that's me. Um, I think that tops my list is, you know, I don't have to be in um, the Hall of Fame or I don't have to be a pro bowler, although those are my goals. My number one goal is to win a Super Bowl. Uh, I would just think that would kind of uh, put a stamp on the journey that I have been through, you know, having watched like every Super Bowl growing up as a, as a kid and being able to play in one and win one would kind of put the exclamation point on uh, my journey as a football player. And then, like I said, Hall of Fame would be awesome. Uh, Pro Bowler would be awesome. Um, but obviously, you got to take baby steps to get to that point. Okay, so you got to Pittsburgh, and you've kind of been on lockdown. Is that right? I've been furniture shopping like crazy, but not really <laughs> furniture interacting shopping, nice. with anyone. I haven't really like been to any lively places. Yeah, so that's, you know, as a as a rookie, that's kind of like... You know, you're looking at houses, you're looking at places, you're looking at furniture, you're trying to get your life together so you can just focus on football. And that's kind of when you interact with all these people. So right. for you, you're kind of, you have to keep a distance from these people, but they still recognize you, I'm sure, whether it's in your car or the door, has the DoorDash guy showed up and been like, oh my God, um, you know, anything like that? When I went to one of the player, player run practices, uh, we had, I had like a mob of people, not waiting for just me, but waiting for the people to come back from to practice and then fly home, just waiting with like uh-huh. 20 things to sign. And I was like, first I was like, how did you know what we were doing and when we were doing it, all that. Um, so that was like the first taste of like crazy fandom that I that I experienced. Um, but yeah, you know, I went and got, I tried to get a car uh, the other day, uh, a rental car. And he's like, man, we can't help you. We have no, we have no more cars left. I was like, all right, like, I guess I'll go to a different enterprise. Walked out the door, and then he, like, came up, and he's like, oh, shoot, like, are you so-and-so? And I was like, yeah. He's like, all right, I got you, I got you. Here, here take my car. <laughs> so he gave you his car. Yeah, and now I have a free car. <laughs> and you gave it to your parents. And that is how my mom got a Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> he stole the guy's car. I hope she doesn't, oh I hope she doesn't hear this. <laughs> okay um then tell us about your youtube channel and how people can follow you personally uh what what do you hope to gain from that and uh where's that youtube t- what, what do we expect to see on your youtube channel yeah so me and my good friend uh scotty mcknight um aka yard um we're kind of chatting in a hotel room okay, yard. uh we we're we we're just chopping up in a hotel room and we you know he's really good with brand development and um Mm-hmm. and that type of stuff. So yeah, YouTube was something I was planning on doing for a long time. And I figured that football, obviously wearing your helmet, it's very hard to market, be marketable when no one really knows what you look, when you, what you look like. Uh, and I really right. understood that when I went to these practices and I wouldn't see someone and recognize them until they said their name. And I was like, oh, I know who you are. I've watched you for however many years, but you just... I just never knew what you look like. So I think YouTube's a really good right. thing to allow me to show um, the world who I am behind the helmet and, you know, not really um, focus on that football aspect more of who I am as a person. So 
you know, I already posted my first YouTube video. It's at youtube.com slash Chase Claypool. And, you know, I plan on folk, um, posting as fre frequently as I can, as much as I can. Obviously, the season gets a little busy and, you know, it kind of hinders me to do that. But uh, I'm planning on posting at least once or twice uh, every couple of weeks. So, so uh, for Steelers fans, do you own a terrible towel? Yes or no? I do. I own multiple. Okay, I was going to say, if you didn't, just give out your address. They'll send you a bunch. Shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> yeah. But since you have one, no worries. Then are you ready for the fourth quarter when opposing teams like the mighty New York Jets piss right down their leg because <laughs> Renegade by Sticks comes on and that song gets the crowd going bananas. Even if the stadium's at half capacity or something like that, there's just a feeling of playing there, and if you know, you know. If you've been there and you've experienced it, you know. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for Renegade by Sticks, Chase? Oh, man, I can't say. Mm. I'm excited and I cannot wait. Am I ready? I might be the one. Do you know how to sing it? Do you know the lyrics? Oh. You don't know the lyrics. Oh, don't make me do it. Don't make me do it. <clears throat> I'll do it. You convince me. Oh, mama, I can say it. Um. That's not bad. <laughs> yes. Well, that, audio loop in the, the rest. Yeah, it's perfect. As far as you know, that was really good. Yeah. Well, I have my headphones on, so I can't hear myself, but that's right. it felt good. That's it. It felt good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm fired up for you, man. Thanks again for taking the time, especially during a, um, a busy time for you. Uh, last thing, any message to the fans out there, Steeler fans watching? What do you got? Fans, uh, I'm excited uh, to play in front of you guys. Make sure you guys stay safe in uh, your own respective environments so that we can play uh, the sport that we love and that you guys love. Uh, appreciate you guys tuning into this podcast. Uh, if you haven't already, go follow Mark on Instagram. Uh, he's really good about following Steelers fans back. Uh, make sure you guys go do that. <laughs> That's perfect. Plug your Instagram is at Chase Claypool 604. Chase Claypool 604. YouTube, we got youtube.com slash Chase Claypool. Twitter? Twitter, Chase Claypool. Um, keep it simple. Chase Claypool, easy enough. Keep it simple. Yeah. Uh, I think that's it. We nailed your social channels. And then at Fourth and Forever on Instagram, youtube.com slash fourth and forever. Beautiful, and you guys need my um, my bank account information for the uh, check that you're about to send? <laughs> Social security, bank account, uh, smash the subscribe button, <laughs> graphic. <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, I'll link my like, um, share. social security number down below. Right. You guys can go ahead and donate me some money. <laughs> Perfect. All right, buddy, thank you again. All right, appreciate it. Like, share, subscribe, uh, at Mark underscore Sanchez, at Fourth and Forever, Instagram, Twitter, all that. You know where to go. Thanks again for having us, and we'll see you soon.